Now, th uh, thank you all for coming out. I was supposed to be there. I was so looking forward to being there, but as you know, uh, things don't often turn out as they're supposed to. Um, now, to give you some background on who I am and where I come from, you've got a little bit from the introduction. My name is Drayden Taylor, and I'm from a small Anishinaabe slash Ojibwe reserve called Curve Lake First Nation, uh, about two hours northeast of Toronto, um, in the heart of an area known as the Quarthas. Uh, uh, when I was growing up, it was a fairly small reserve, eight, 900 people. It's about 12, 1300 now. And I think I'm going to be talking about my exploration of the indigenous funny bone, indigenous humor, how I've, uh, how, how it's affected me um, and how I've sort of decided to take it, celebrate it, and, um, and basically hold it up for everybody to appreciate. Now, in order to understand that, you have to understand a little bit about my, my path into this world. I'm one of those rare breeds of animals you will come across occasionally called a, called a um, professional writer. That is to say, I do not have a day job. I do not spend my afternoons saying, would you like fries with that? Um, as a professional writer, that means I work in many different fields. Um, I'm a playwright, I'm a novelist, I do documentaries, I write short stories, I write television shows, I did a graphic novel, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the thing to take away from that is the fact that with all, uh, as a professional writer, more importantly, I think of myself as a contemporary storyteller. As a contemporary story, that is to say, in today's society, there's so many different ways of telling stories. It used to be the vast, the, 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 the predominant way of telling a story was oral. You sat around a fire and later on around a kitchen table with a couple of mugs of tea and you told stories, some of them true, most of them funny, um, and as time passed and cultures evolved, the methods of storytelling changed. They went from oral storytelling, and then they went into print, and then there was theater, there was radio, there was television, there was movies, and it's gotten to the point today where there's so many different ways of telling stories even video games today have intricate and um, deep background stories uh, for all of the characters to help play the game a bit more. So when I say I'm a contemporary storyteller, I work in all these different environments because I, I just love telling a good story. And there's so many ways to tell good stories. And I'm very, very interested in exploring as much of them as I can. Um, but on, on to the topic of humor, I don't think, I think I should say, my exploration of humor began as a child, as with most people. I grew up on the reserve, um, surrounded by family. I guess you should know, um, at the same time, I come from both a big family and a small family. I come from a big family because my mother was the oldest of 14, which, as I've been told, used to happen before they had the internet. And uh, so with marriages and stuff like that, I had about I had about 20, 22 aunts and uncles and about the same number of first cousins. So we were a very big extended family. Um, but at the same time, I come from a small family. I'm a single child of a single parent. And my mother blames that on the fact that when I was born, I was 11 pounds, 13 ounces. Um, breach, no cesarean. So evidently that was enough for my mother. I like to think I gave my mother both quantity and quality. <laughs> so that's the environment I grew up in. I, I was just me and my mother, but you step outside the door of our house, there was a huge extended family. And I was very fortunate to have grown up right across from my grandparents. Um, and during the summer from, I guess, uh, early June to early October, it would not be uncommon for, my, for there to be bonfires in front of my grandparents, a huge fire pit, and I would have aunts, uncles, cousins, family, friends come over there, sit, and while away the hours telling funny 
stories. I grew up listening to funny stories because where I where I grew up on the reserve, you know, when when I was young, I'm, uh, I like to I tell people I'm I'm a, I'm a thousand years old. When I was young, we had two television stations, and for all the young people here who don't understand my next phrase, ask one of the older people in the audience around you to explain this term. But the two television stations we had were very snowy. So we could watch it only only when the weather was 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 all the wind was blowing in one direction or however however those things work. So for entertainment, we would sit around and we would tell funny stories. So I would sit there and I would listen to my family telling funny stories, and it was absolutely fabulous. It was fun. You just sit, watch the fire, watch your family, and you would learn so much from those stories because traditionally, culturally, our storytelling was a method of uh, preserving history, expressing philosophy, um, humor, uh, psychology, uh, explaining so much about the universe. It, it was, for in many different ways, it was an education. Any good bout of storytelling can teach you so much, uh, directly and indirectly. And um, when it was time for me to go to bed as a kid, I lived right across the road. And I would go home to bed, but back then we didn't have air conditioners. Uh, we were lucky to have, um, if we had mosquito um, um, netting on the windows. So I would go to sleep with the windows <laughs> wide open because it was a hot summer. And I could still hear those stories being told. I could still hear the laughter. In fact, that became my lullaby. I would go to sleep to the sound of laughter and stories and that had an impact on me growing up it made me sort of that made it made me the it made it the, the default for me um because I, could, I couldn't think of a, a of a better way of spending your evening um now part of my journey in exploring indigenous humor was of course going through the school system um becoming a writer now i uh I'd always wanted to be a writer, but there was a slight problem. I'm, the very first memory I have of being, of, 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 of uh, I, uh, one of the very first memories I have right off the top was being a little kid sitting on some steps of the house I grew up. On my lap was a big stack of comic books. And I remember thinking, next year I get to go to school and I'll be able to read these. And I did go to school and I just discovered something very odd and very important. I wanted to be a writer very, very much, but... There were no other native writers I came across. They weren't taught in school. There were none in the library. And I thought maybe native people aren't allowed to become writers. This is my beginning of my awakeness into the, into the world of, of the indigenous community outside the reserve. And I wanted to become a writer, but I didn't know uh, if native people were allowed to become a writer. And for everybody out there who's sort of looking at me and seeing perhaps my bluish green eyes and my fair complexion or wondering what I'm doing talking about native issues, I always like to say my standard self-identifying joke is I'm half Ojibwe, half Caucasian, so technically that makes me an occasion. <laughs> or as I like to say, a special occasion, if not a memorable occasion. So... Uh, I, I wanted to be a writer and I decided to do research. I decided to do what native youth have done for thousands of years. When we want to know something, we go and ask those who are wiser and older than us. So I went to my grade 11 English teacher and I said, sir, is it possible to make a living from creative writing? And without even looking up, I remember he was in a, sitting at his desk looking for something in the bottom left hand drawer of his desk. He, uh, he, without even looking up, he, he turned to me and saying, no, not really. So I was told in grade 11 that there's not much point in being a writer uh, and that I should give it up. And so um, the de I, I'm a big fan of irony. The decades went by and I uh, ended up becoming a writer. This, this month, my 34th book is coming out. And one of the great things I get to do is I talk to a lot of youth, both native and non-native, about the journey of being a writer. And when I'm talking to all these kids, I always tell them, the one thing I can, I can teach you, the one thing you need to remember, when you walk out that door, the only nugget of information I can give you 
is never trust your grade 11 English teacher. <laughs> the other person I went to was my mother. I went to my mother and I told my mother I wanted to be a writer. And my mother looked at me with a very perplexed look and said, why do you want to be a writer? It's not going to get you anywhere. Now, this is my mother telling me this, and it, it, it sort of went deep into me. And, but I understood where my mother was coming from. My mother um, I was born and raised and lived on the reserve. Her first language was Anishinaabe, and she had a grade six education and, and had spent 30 years working for white people, cooking and cleaning. So the idea of being a writer was just literally not on her radar. Um, so uh, with these two things uh, in my consciousness, I gave up wanting to be a writer. I gave all that up. And I'm going to skip over a lot of this. But what really what, what I became apparent to me, my, my discovery of humor, specifically of irony, was through um, both on the reserve, just sort of the everyday attitude of the people I lived with. And then when I left the reserve to go into the city to make my fortune, the perspective native or non-native people had of native people. It was so bizarre. My college roommate, when we met, asked upon, immediately upon, uh, upon meeting me, what kind of horse I like to ride. And the Ojibwe are not horse people. I, I, I shrugged and said, when he said, what kind of horse do you, do you like to ride? I said, uh, hobby horses. Um, and basically, I realized that, that the perception of Native people in the dominant culture, as I'm sure many of you know, was one of the stoic Indian, the sad Indian, the tragic Indian, the disappearing Indian, all these adjectives for Native people that were um, not pleasant, not positive, in fact, were dysfunctional in nature. And I found that very, very odd. Um, and and it, it, it sort of persisted. I remember, like, and in all, a lot of it, a lot of the humor that I deal with deals from the misunderstanding of non-native, non-native people have of native people. I once worked on a television series um, uh, called Spirit Bay up here. I was, I was young. I was the technical advisor um, just because they couldn't find anything else for me to do. And they would give me these scripts that took place in Northwestern Ontario. And I was from Southern Ontario. And I would read them and they would say, is this technically accurate? And I would say, yes, native people eat toast. But again, there's no perception of what native people were really like. This is back in the eighties and nineties. So around this time, I sort of began to reevaluate my journey to being a writer because I felt there was much more of a need of it. And where this really, really took place was when um, I was asked to become the writer in residence for a native theater company. Now, up here in Canada, I don't know much about, about down the States, but around, uh, there was something I refer to as the contemporary native literary renaissance. And it began in 1986. In my opinion, this is my opinion again, 1986, November 22nd, 8 p.m. The wind was out of the east, and the Toronto Maple Leafs were playing badly. That's when uh, this little play opened in downtown Toronto and revolu revolutionized the larger Canadian theater and literary community, primarily because it was a play written by a Cree unknown Cree playwright uh, uh, produced by a native theater company at the Native Friendship Center in downtown Toronto. Now, prior to this, nobody, the native people weren't really telling their stories. There'd be the odd book or something that would pop up occasionally. But uh, overall, the native voice was essentially non-existent in the larger picture of, of Canadian publishing, film, et cetera, theater. And this one play, what makes this so extraordinary, again, is, is also part of the humor. This is a play that when it premiered, it was, again, unknown theater company, unknown playwright, unknown actors, that they had to give away tickets at the beginning of the play to uh, go out on the street and give away free tickets. 
But by the end of the run, it was standing room only because what had happened here is this was one of the first um, opportunities for the dominant culture to see native storytelling and native humor, for lack of a better term, in its natural environment. The plot of the play is essentially um, seven native women up on Manitoulin Island, which is a large island in Lake Huron, who want to drive seven hours down to Toronto in a van, in a van to play at the world's largest bingo game. That is the plot. And what makes it so unique is it's the, the, the characterization of these women and the humor. Toronto and Canada were not ready for this. They had not, were not, were not, were ready for this. I'm sorry, I'm wrong. They were ready for this. The perception of native people, the alcoholic Indian, et cetera, was still strong then. And I think they were not ready or they were very ready for this new perspective of native people. So this is sort of, I'm, I'm beginning to, to talk more about, the, the, about how native humor sort of became present in the dominant culture. I was asked to be the playwright in residence. I did, I did not like theater. I thought theater artists were pretentious. Uh, I was too happy. I was writing television shows, et cetera. But I needed the money. I had a very hungry landlord that liked to be fed on a regular basis. So I said, yes. Um, and uh, I'm one of the few people you'll ever meet that got into theater for the money. And so I met this theater company and if I'm going to be here, I decided I want to learn more about what this industry was. If I'm here, I want to I want to do something. So I began to read and see as many native plays as I could. And this is where things get interesting for me and my journey into the celebration of indigenous humor. Almost all of the plays coming out of the First Nation communities, the indigenous community, the native community, the plays, the novels, the movies, the poetry, etc. We're all dark, depressing, bleak, sad, and angry. Almost all the, uh, the narratives that were being told were either historical narratives, victim narratives, or the byproducts coming from post-contact stress disorder. Essentially, all the characters being created were either oppressed, depressed, or suppressed. And I found this both odd, but extremely logical. Because when an oppressed people get their voice back, they're going to write about being oppressed. It just makes logical sense. So there's a saying that that author I told you about who wrote The Red Sisters, Thompson Highway, he has a saying, before the healing can take place, the poison must be exposed. And that's what was happening during those first couple of years, the first 10, 20 years of the contemporary native literary renaissance, the poison was being exposed. I remember having conversations with Maori writers in New Zealand, Aborigine writers in Australia, and Dalit writers who are frequent, once called the untouchable, touchables or Dalit writers in India. And it became, we talked about this. And basically, you know, when you have been at the bottom of the social hierarchy of any given society, and you're finally given a chance to tell your story, chances are it won't be a comedy. So that's what was happening during the late 80s and the 90s. Basically, all these stories were coming out of the First Nations community, and they dealt with the more dysfunctional aspect of the First Nation community. Um, uh, the, the abuse, you know, up here we have residential schools, we had um, uh, the scoop up having to do with adoption, all these horrible side effects of colonization. And, um, uh, all, and Native writers, they basically said, you know, um, it's kind of sucks being colonized. And this is why. And they would write these plays, these novels about how being colonized sucked. And that was all fine and dandy. And unfortunately, you know, as I said, that was, that was almost the constant diet of indigenous literary storytelling. All of these stories, these dysfunctional stories. 
And it almost got to be a, a horrible, horrible cliche. Um, you know, I remember talking with two different women coming out of two different plays in two different cities. I asked them the same question and I got the same answer. I said, what did you think of the play? And they both said, I don't think I'm going to go see any more Native plays. I'm tired of being depressed. So this was my uh, introduction to the theater and the, the literary world. You know, basically, in order to be a Native writer, you had to write sad, tragic stories. But that wasn't what interested me. I've been very fortunate to have traveled to over 143, no, sorry, 140, 150 First Nation Indigenous reserves and reservations across Canada and the States. And everywhere I've been, I've been greeted with a laugh, a smile, and a joke. And I wasn't seeing this in the theater. I would look at my mother, who you heard me mention, but um, and my mother was a very vivacious woman with a great sense of humor. And my mother certainly was not oppressed, depressed, or suppressed. So I was having a major conundrum with understanding the representation of Indigenous people in literature with the reality I was seeing. And as luck would have it, I happened to bump into and uh, spend time with an elder on the Blood Reserve in Alberta. And I was talking to him about this. Like I was concerned that as an up and coming young writer, am I going to have to put tragedy and oppression and rape and all these other horrible things that have happened to Indigenous people in all my work in order to receive recognition as an Indigenous author? And he stopped and he thought for a moment and he said, he, he gave me a phrase that has basically been instrumental in my development as a writer. He said that in his opinion for native people, humor is the WD-40 <laughs> of healing. <laughs> and I thought about that and I really liked that humor. I assume they have WD-40 in America. Um, the uh, humor is the WD-40 of healing. I mean, and it, it goes so well with what Thompson had said. Before the healing can take place, the poison must be exposed. Of course. And then right next to it, humor is the WD-40 of healing. And I thought all the other writers, all the other creators out there were exposing the poison far better than I could. I was more interested in the healing. Um, it was certainly more fun, and um, and no, very few other people were doing it at that time. As I said, you, uh, the, the dominant culture in Canada, when you thought about Native literature in any way, it what dealt with <laughs> darkness. So I decided I wanted to celebrate the Indigenous sense of humor. I wanted to hold it up. I wanted to shine light on it. I wanted the world to know how funny native people were based on my own travels etc that it wasn't always doom and gloom and we dealt with the doom and gloom through humor so um i i i would write a bunch of articles and essays about various aspects of native culture for newspapers and i decided to write a comedy and a full-fledged native play that just celebrated the indigenous sense of humor um, with absolutely no social redeeming qualities whatsoever. That was my original intention, but I discovered that um, when you do an Indigenous comedy, it's not, uh, no, uh, the fact that I'm doing comedy from the Indigenous perspective uh, is, a perspe is a socially relevant comment within itself. Anyways, I read four types of plays, theater for young audiences, dramas that deal that have a lot of humor in it because that is how we deal with drama in the native community again i'm speaking about my native community and travel places i've been to i write um full-fledged comedies and i write what i call intellectual satires that deal with a certain aspect of indigenous culture and i explore it and i just wrap it in in parody and satire etc now, when I talk about drama and, and the sort of the humor from the indigenous community that that it's like the two sides of the, 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 the Greek mass, you've got the comedy and you've got the tragedy. And I never see that more obvious than in 
our community. And I'll give you an example. About uh, about 10 years ago, my mother passed away. And um, we were going to meet with a funeral director about her funeral. So I went with two aunts, two cousins, and my partner, all women. And we sat down with the funeral director, and we were trying to plan my mother's funeral. And the best way to put it is there was so much laughter. We were laughing because basically we're thinking, what would my mother want? How would my mother deal with this? My mother, first of all, would be so embarrassed that there'd be all this attention upon her in this environment. And then two, her, you know, what the, the funeral director wanted to know what her favorite flower was. And we said um, it was uh, sunflowers. The problem is my mother had the nerve to die in late January, right after Chinese New Year. And evidently the Chinese community in Southern and Central Ontario had hoovered up every possible sunflower in the province. So we had to come up with their second favorite flower, which we had got into arguments over. So all this stuff was happening. We were laughing, laughing. And of course there was a wake downstairs, which even made things funnier. But after about 20, 25 minutes, we finally planned my mother's funeral after, after much consideration and laughter. And I stood up and the funeral director stood up, leaned over, shook my hand and said, and I'm quoting him verbatim. Thank you. I don't get to say this very much, but that was fun. <laughs> so, again, talking about the humor in Native Tragedy, that is a good example of it. So I decided I wanted to write. It had never been done. Uh, up in Canada at that time, in the early 90s, uh, it was the beginning of this concept of political correctness. Um, and people were, did, people were very concerned about, about Native people, et cetera, and, all, and just not embracing the concept of us having a sense of humor. So I decided to write a comedy. Um, and it was called The Bootlegger Blues. And the Bootlegger Blues was a story about a 58-year-old good Christian Ojibwe woman who, through a series of circumstances, finds herself in possession of 143 cases of beer that she has to bootleg in order to buy an organ for the church. And it's loosely based on a true story. And needless to say, my mother was so angry when I wrote that play. So I wrote that play. It was produced by a Native theater company. We toured it to Native communities, did it very, very well. Uh, took it to, um, and it would play in urban centers, at, like it would play at, at Native friendship centers. And I got what I consider my best review, which was um, an old man walked out of, his, uh, out of it, walked over to me, asked if I wrote it. I said, yes, sir, I did. And he shook my hand and he said, your play made me homesick. And I got, I've always considered that my best review. Now, what's interesting, as I said about that play, is it is it had never been seen before. We always thought it would disappear. It's sort of like Native theater was young, new. We were experimenting with form. We did a comedy, a farce, essentially. Thought it was gone. Thought it would disappear. But the next year, I get a call from another theater company, a mainstream theater company, a Caucasian theater company, who said, we write, read your play and we'd like to produce it. And I went, cool, great, wonderful. I can finally get myself some of that Caucasian money. And uh, so, so we did the normal theater thing. We did auditions, got a director, all that. We went down and we did it. And the theater company is near a place called, um, oh God, what is, what is that town? Port Dover, Port Dover on Lake Erie. You may have heard of that lake. Um, and uh, we went down there, we rehearsed it, did everything you normally do do with a, with a play for this theater company. You know, this theater company normally is a summer theater company. They usually do tourists and and cottage people. And let's let's, let's how to put this bluntly: the vast majority of their clientele, their hair had a bluish tinge to it. So, opening night came, my comedy, my celebration of Indigenous humor. humor. The lights go up in this theater of 311 people. Opening night packed. And um, my, my, my celebration, uh, my, my celebration of indigenous humor, curtain goes up. Absolute silence. Nothing. Off in the distance, you can hear coyotes howling. 
<laughs> tumbleweeds went across the stage. And I'm dying there in the front row. I'm thinking, well, there goes all that Caucasian money. But also I'm thinking, why is it working? Maybe there is a disconnect between the dominant culture and native humor. Maybe they're not getting it because the actors were doing a great job. The director had done a brilliant job. And let's face it, the writing was brilliant. Um, and I even made sure they put the word comedy on the poster. But one of the things I didn't mention, Port Dover is about 20 minutes away from the largest First Nations community in Canada. This little place called Six Nations. And again, you may have heard of it. About 25,000 Haudenosaunee people live there, two of whom were in the play. So every performance, there was about six to 10 Indigenous people in the audience, usually in a balcony packed together. So as I said, the curtain goes up, absolute silence, except for those eight people in the balcony. I can hear them laughing all alone. And I look up and I'm watching them. And, um, and there, as I said, there's two people from the reserve, reserve in the place. These are all cousins, aunts, uncles, parents. They're, they're laughing. And I'm watching for a second and I've noticed the most unusual thing to happen. After about five minutes, the circle of white people around them started to laugh. Five minutes later, another circle of white people started to laugh. And it began to get bigger and bigger. It was like throwing a rock into a pond and watching the circles happening. Now, I, took, uh, I finally figured it out, right? Because at this time, as I said, there was political correctness. And the vast majority of Native theater was designed to push the envelope, to ask difficult questions, to make the audience uncomfortable. And so this audience showed up expecting to be made to feel guilty, right? Here was a play about Native people and beer. And yet, ironically, within the context of the play, nobody ever drinks a single beer in the entire play. So by the end of the first act, everybody was laughing. Because basically, the rest of the audience, the, 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 the white people, had been waiting for permission to laugh. And when they saw the Native people laughing, they realized they can laugh too. And they started to laugh and they enjoyed it. And, and the, that, that production um, beat the box office projection. And I had four other plays there over the following, I think, uh, seven or eight years. So it was, sort of, it was sort of like, again, they were waiting for permission to laugh. They were given permission to laugh and they enjoyed it very, very much. Because one of the things that I often talk about about Native humor is, um, we're not reinventing the wheel when I talk about indigenous humor. Um, at the end of the day, when I go home, I turn on TV, I watch The Simpsons, Big Bang Theory, all of that sort of stuff, and I laugh. 90% of the people who buy my books, who go and see my play, are white, and they laugh. So there, there, there are more similarities in our sense of humor than there are differences. So. Um, I, I kind of tell people in my humor, people ask me, do I write for native or non-native audiences? There are certain jokes that, yes, are very peculiar to the indigenous culture. You know, how many bologna craft dinner and Kentucky Fried Chicken jokes can you put into a play? But we tend to laugh at everything. So I can, I can write for both cultures. And sometimes, actually, one of the interesting aspects is when, um, when you do a play, the stage manager times each act and puts it in a report. And when there's a play and the audience is half to two thirds native, the, the, the running time of each act, usually about 42 to 44 minutes, is usually about five to six minutes longer just from sheer laughter because they get all the subtle nuances. So anyways, I'm getting, I'm, I'm going off topic here. Um, so, you know, so I started doing all these native comedies. And then based upon that, I decided I want to explore the concept of humor more intensely. I've been writing humor, but I, I, I've been writing a lot of humor, but I wanted to know more about humor. So I had these two opportunities. I ended up directing a documentary 
for the National Film Board of Canada, exploring and deconstructing Indigenous humor. And it was called Redskins, Tricksters, and Puppies Too. I also ended up, based on the success of that, I ended up editing and compiling a book, again, that explores and deconstructs Indigenous humor through a series of essays called Me Funny. And what I did with Me Funny is I contacted a whole bunch of people in the Indigenous community who in one way or another earned their living through Indigenous humor. So I had articles from stand-up comedians. I had articles from novelists. I had articles from actors. I had articles from, or essays from different people who work in the Indigenous humor field. And we talked about it for, for the, the length of the book. And not only that, I spent a year collecting what I referred to as Indian jokes. Um, I, I would use them to uh, break up the chapters. And it was very, very fun to do that because so I got Indian jokes from all over the world. And some of them, a lot of them in this day and age, I did that book about, I would say 12, 14 years ago, are very politically incorrect in this day and age. Because that's one of the interesting things about Indigenous humor. Indigenous humor is a form of survival humor. I did a, uh, I've been to two conferences on multicultural humor. I was in one in India and I followed a woman who was from the University of Tel Aviv who did a presentation on humor and the Holocaust. And I listened to what she did, what she talked about. And I thought it's very similar for native people. A lot of our humor is filtered through the tragedy of colonization. And the, the byproduct of humor, of indigenous humor is it's a reaction to and a protection from um, the barbs of civilization. So as a result, a lot of our humor can be very politically incorrect, right? Um, I, uh, I was almost going to tell you one or two, but I better not. I don't want to. I don't want to get a call from the the Irpa Museum's uh, Human Resources Department. But I'll give you an example. Uh, here are some of the interesting things about Indigenous humor, too. I found there, there's a bunch of different varieties of it. One of them is there's a type of humor, and this is a type of cultural humor um, that, you know, um, how can I put this? That's, when somebody from a, from, a, from a particular nation is, is telling a joke, uh, the... the, the I find that either one, sometimes you don't know they've made a joke until they start laughing themselves, or two, they tell a joke and it's so in your face that you don't know whether to laugh or punch them in the face. Um, but what's, what's, what's sort of interesting is a lot of the, these Indian jokes that have come out, they're either... You can, they have the DNA. You, you, you can deconstruct the DNA of the joke. And from the joke, you can either tell that this is a joke written by Native people, for Native people, or this is a joke that has been culturized. It has been culturally appropriated from other people um, in, into, into their world. I'll give you an example of one. Um, this is what I think a Native joke is written by Native people for Native people. Why do Native people hate snow? Because it's white and all over the land. But um, uh, here's a here's a here's one of my favorite jokes that sort of I think has been a, a culturally appropriated um, uh, and indigenized, for lack of a better term. And this is this is and I have to keep stressing again to HR there. I didn't write these; these were submitted to me for the book. But here's here's one of my favorite jokes. These two native women are getting to know each other. And one woman is absolutely shocked and surprised to discover that she has 10 children that she's all named Lloyd. And the other woman can't understand this. She says, why did you name all your kids Lloyd? Don't you find that confusing? And then the mother goes, oh, no, not at all. In fact, if anything, I find it to be a great time saver. First thing in the morning, all you have to do is yell, Lloyd, time to get up. Lloyd, breakfast is ready. Lloyd, time for school they'll hear and they'll know what they have to do. But the other woman isn't convinced. She says, but what do you do if you have to talk to just one of your children, like the second youngest or the oldest? What do you do then? 
And the mother goes, oh, well, if I have to talk to just one of my kids in particular, I call them by their last name. <laughs> That's one of those jokes you have to think about, right? <laughs> so anyways, um, uh, I see I'm running out of time here. I'm going to end off with another, but sort of my introduction to the... Um, I had another play I did. It was called The Baby Blues. And it was about an aging fancy dancer, an aging powwow dancer who's getting a little old to be dancing powwow anymore, but that's what he does. He spends his whole summer driving from one reserve to another just to go from powwow to powwow. He's getting old. He just He's there for three things, dancing, partying, and chasing women, not necessarily in that order. I don't know if you have people like that in your culture. And he goes to this one reserve where he hasn't been to in a very long time. He sets up his tent, and he goes and sees a beautiful young girl down by the water, and he walks down, and he starts to sweet talk her. And through the conversation, both we and he discover it's his long-lost daughter from his last trip there 18 years ago. Again, don't you hate it when that happens? So that's essentially the play. And he tries to get away, but they runs into the, the, the mother who sabotages his truck and won't let him leave until uh, in that weekend he can come up with 17 years back child support. So uh, basically it takes place out of powwow. It's a powwow play dealing with responsibilities and all that. So produced it. I got another one of those phone calls from somebody who said, I, I, we read your play. We'd like to produce it. And I said, cool, great, wonderful. Uh, send me the check. And he said, uh, no, wait, you're going to have to help us translate it. And I said, translate it? Where are you calling from? And they said, oh, sorry. Uh, we're calling from the University of Venice, Italy. And I said, Venice, that's a place with water for streets, right? And they said, yes. And I said, Okay, um, and I'm thinking about the play, right? It's about an aging Lothario who's just there to party, chase women, nothing else. He's there for a good time, not a long time. Um, basically has nothing to tie him down and just, well, just chasing women. And I said, why do you want to produce this play? And he said, I think it's something Italians can relate to. So I said, okay, fine. We translated into Italian. It was produced. And I didn't get the chance to see it. I didn't get to Venice for a couple months later. But um, they sent me this thing. You may remember this from your ancient history class. They sent me a video cassette of the production. And I turned it on and I watched it. It was one of the most surreal things I've ever seen. So you have to imagine this, right? It's a powwow play being produced in a Venetian, University of Venice, Italy, and I'm, I don't know if there's any Italians there, I think I'm pronouncing it right, in a teatro, an Italian theater. So it's all, um, all the set designs of the powwow are designed by Italian set designers who've never been to North America, let alone a powwow. All the powwow costumes are designed by Italian costume designers who had never been to North America or a powwow. And all the actors who are Italian had never been to a First Nations community in North America or whatever, are running back and forth across the stage, speaking Italian, going, il powwow. <laughs> One of the most surreal things of my life. Um, and of course, this is all part of a larger thing I've sort of explored humor-wise. My fourth my fourth uh, comedy was called The Berlin Blues about a German business conglomerate that comes to a small central Ontario First Nations community wanting to build the world's largest native theme park called Ojibwe World, which has um, things like bumper canoes and uh, medicine Ferris wheel and a 44 meter high dream catcher with interlacing laser beam webbing that keeps killing all the birds. And the big draw is a production of Dances with Wolves, the musical. And the reason, the reason I did that is Germans are bizarrely fond of North American Aboriginal people, but North American Aboriginal people from the 1880s, they still think we hunt buffalo and everybody lives in teepees. I went to a German powwow. Um, it's just absolutely. In 1936, Adolf Hitler made North American Aboriginal people honorary Aryans. Think about that for a moment. I'll leave, I'll leave you with that as I think my time is up. <laughs>